Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum teacher, intuitive guide, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This podcast is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts and ideas validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. Whether you are listening to this show while driving or commuting, doing chores around the house, relaxing on a couch, or flying in a spaceship across the galaxy, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living and to my new mini-series Quantum Chat, microdosing spiritual insights in a food-for-thought style, where in each episode, together with my special and returning guest, Marin Muter, we focus on just one topic, one burning question, one quantum mystery that probably everyone has a view on, but no real answer to, as we can only speculate and guess, which is fun. Hi, Maren. Thanks for joining me again for another exciting quantum chat. Hi, Anna. What do you have up your sleeve today? (laughs) (laughs) Well, today's question is a big one. What happens when we die? You know, when I was little, about five years old, I asked my father, what will happen when I die? And my father replied, well, your body will be buried and you simply cease to exist. That was the scariest thought ever. I was petrified and I couldn't imagine how it feels or what it means that I won't exist anymore in any shape or form. But at the same time, I intuitively knew that this can't be true, especially that I had a vivid recollection of my past life in the same country, which chronologically was just before this one and as that was during the World War II. I could read the language from the age of three, and I simply remembered my other life. I remembered that I died as a teenage boy, a Jew in the concentration camp. And so at the ripe age of five, I decided to embark on a life quest to find out how life really works so that I could tell everyone who didn't know. (laughs) But when I tried to explain this to my parents and tell them about my other life, I was sternly told to stop talking this nonsense ever again, which of course I did, but just for a while, not forever. (laughs) So after decades of research, study and meditation on top of my own reincarnation memories, very clear reincarnation memories, and also skills carried over into this lifetime, such as my language skills which to me is an irrefutable proof of reincarnation, something that I simply know rather than believe in. Here is my take on what happens when we die. Our consciousness or soul leaves our body and moves to the afterlife, which is a domain of much higher frequencies. Or, to be more precise, our consciousness withdraws its attention from the physical body. We exist in the afterlife as individualized fragments of the Creator, as pure spiritual beings, where we review and evaluate our life experience and plan the new incarnations. We are omnipresent, and yet we retain the individual characteristics and memories of the person we were in each lifetime, as we know, we can communicate with our loved ones left behind with meaningful messages as that personality. We can reincarnate on the physical plane or any other plane or another planet in another galaxy, another universe or in another dimension in any form. One of my clients I took through a soul journey experience recalled their life as conscious existence as a planet in our solar system, and also as a notion, which was very interesting to say the least. Death as we know it is just a transition 
from this physical experience to another, which is like coming home, by the way. So effectively, we as a consciousness never die. What are your thoughts about this? (laughs) Well, I 100% agree. Our consciousness does not die. It's only the physical body. And the consciousness is using this body as the observation tool. And when it's done, this body is done, and the observation is done, the physical body dies, and the attention to this life experience is no longer, so it's no longer needed. And the consciousness basically looks up from the microscope and says, okay, that was good. (laughs) And the life experience there is done. When we look at reincarnation, we're not planning, I mean, this is my belief, is that we're not up there planning and reviewing this life because our consciousness got to see the totality of this life, this life you played out both sides of every scenario, both sides of every choice, both sides of every situation that you've ever been in. Your consciousness, because it's on the ethereal plane, got to see each side of what happened to you on both sides. You had chocolate ice cream, you had vanilla ice cream. You went to the seashore, you went to the mountains at the same exact time. So there's no life carryover from one life to another. And this is what I study, especially in children, is uh, past life memories. But what a past life memory is, is it's our filtration system in the brain. So the filtration system in the brain takes ethereal information and it says, is this information relevant to this life experience? Is it familiar? So it starts out with familiarity. And then the more familiar it is and the more relevant it becomes, our brain will start then translating it into what we see, feel, hear, taste, and smell, a projection into this life incarnation. So when we have a past life memory, especially as children, what's happening is there's ethereal information out there, and we have certain brain waves that are in our brain. And sometimes we can see this through savantism. So children are born and they know how to paint. Children are born and they know music and math and reading at very young ages and at levels or degrees that far surpass their peers, even far surpass just the lay person, the lay adult. A past life memory works the very same way. It is a form of savantism. There are frequencies that didn't mute once you left your, you were born. So in utero, you have free flow. When you're born, that brain mutes all of that and says, okay, we're just going to filter in what is needed at this time. So that's, we have these frequencies that are open in our brain. And we have these memories and life experiences out there, part of this symphony, and your brain is still listening to the whole symphony when it's not supposed to be. And so you have these things coming by. And so you might have had, well, obviously you did have this memory of being a Jewish boy in a concentration camp. And your brain says, oh, you know what? That's familiar. For whatever reason, your brain says that's familiar. And it brings it in and it says, okay, I think this could be relevant. I think this could be relevant. And then it brings all this, the memories and everything else with it. Once it becomes irrelevant, the detail of that memory is going to go away. And typically for children, that's around 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. Those past life memories are muted and the child barely even remembers having those memories and they their brain fills them with their memories of the current life. Their parents, however, remember. (laughs) Their parents remember it a lot because if all of a sudden their child's saying, oh, call me Fred and their name is Georgette, they're going to be like, okay, you wanted me to call you Fred for a year and a half. And And Georgette, when she's older, she's like, I don't remember that, but the parents do. So your brain will recalibrate to what is relevant here. And the reason why like savantism, playing music or math, lasts longer than a past life memory is because we create relevance then. We see that the child loves math, so we give them more math problems. And their brain is saying, ah, this is relevant and I need this. And we're putting them in front of the piano and and they're saying, okay, this is, your brain is saying, this is relevant and it will continue throughout that child's life. Uh, But the past life memory isn't relevant because it doesn't 
have any influence into this life. It's not relevant to this life experience because it's not the same vantage point that your consciousness is looking at or looking from. Okay. And that's a very interesting point. But my question is, when you say that our brain decides whether something is some memory or information is relevant or not relevant, when you say our brain, what is our brain? Is it our soul? Is it our consciousness? Is it our ego? What is the frequency? What is the energy that makes this decision that this is relevant, this is not relevant? What is it? Because brain is just just a tool, it's just a computer. The brain is a tool. The people talk about a veil, right? We think of a veil. We think we want to go, what's on the other side of the veil? What happens when we die? All, all this, that veil is only in one place for each of us. And it is created in only one place for each of us. And that is the brain. Our body resides on the other side of the veil. We're outside the veil. So the only thing that we're seeing right now is the veiled translation of relevant information. So it's part of this tool, this observation tool. So your brain is part of your consciousness's <laughs> tool. Your consciousness ultimately is saying is, you know, it's part of that consciousness, part of that overarching consciousness that can I'm trying to think of the best way to say it. So so our consciousness decides is this relevant to this life experience? If it isn't, it's gonna it's gonna boot it out. The brain, the veil, the veiled system that our brain is designed to create ultimately will translate what we see before us. And so it's the last line of ethereal space before we enter the vantage point that we are at right now. So it's not the soul. It's not, it's just a tool and it's a filtration tool. It's like putting a water filter in your faucet. You only want the clean, the, you know, water that your body wants to drink and all of the rest of the stuff stays within that filter or doesn't even hit the filter. So if we look at the veil as a filter, then that's exactly what's happening. And we've actually, um, scientifically are starting to see this vortex of energy above the human brain or above um, mammals' brains. And that is literally the the veil in creation. That's the filtration system I'm talking about, which is, I do talk about that in my book, um, Your Quantum Brain. And we go into all of these kind of questions, which is fantastic. So Okay. And yes, I will again include a link to the book in the show notes. But just... Um... Just to drill this a little bit further, so it is our consciousness ultimately that decides this is relevant, this is not relevant, and what information is retained in my conscious mind. So for example, like in my case, as I said, I basically carried over my language skills because I was born in the same country. And I remember when I was was about three years old, I picked up a newspaper and started reading it. My parents almost fainted because no one has ever, by the time, no one has ever taught me how to read. I'm curious in a sense, why did my consciousness decide that it was relevant for me to be born already with the language skills? Yeah. So that you're in utero when the brain development like we were talking about, and and I use frequencies a lot. It's not exactly how it looks, but it's easy for us to imagine, you know, these frequencies coming from the ethereal into our brains. So that's the only reason why I use this. You were born with kind of like a form of savantism, okay? You had the ability to read, you had the ability to pick up languages and, and whatever. You utilized those and you continued to utilize those because those are skills that you will be using the rest of your life. Reading, you'll use the rest of your life. So it's not going to mute that. It's just that you got to get to that point a lot faster than people that have to learn how to read. So it's not that your consciousness said, oh, she needs to have these skills. I'm going to give her these skills at birth or at a very young age because. I want to, 
It's just that the development of your brain left these certain segues, these certain frequencies open. It just didn't close all the way to mute that. And because it was relevant and it, a skill like that is relevant to basically any life learning how to read, it's not something that's going to go away. So you got very lucky. <laughs> yes. And that was something very normal to me, but something unexplainable to, <laughs> to everyone else. <laughs> exactly. Yes. It's quite the phenomenon. Yes. But I really like your your explanation, you know, with, with the veils and picking up the relevant information because it gives me interesting visuals. <laughs> mm -hmm. Beautiful. Okay, there you go. A brief answer to the question, what happens when we die? Or at least some food for thought. Thank you, Maren. We'll speak again in the next edition of Quantum Chat. Thank you, Anna. And thank you for including me in this is great topic today. If you guys enjoyed this, please let us know by going to Anna's website. The link is below and you can email her, give her your ideas, thoughts, comments, concerns, whatever you want to share with us. That would be fantastic. Thank you very much. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.